see you all again. If you're a first time guest, uh, welcome. We hope you feel welcome here and um, just enjoy worshiping God in this evening with us together. We're happy that you're here. We're continuing our series on the Apostle Paul, not focusing so much on him, but what he is doing for Christ and what Christ is doing through him. And we've spoken about his conversion. We've spoken about uh, the armor of God. We've spoken about how he was before governors and judges. And so far, we've, we've painted, you know, a kind of up-and-up picture from his conversion onwards. But I love how the Bible many times is brutally honest. And if you have someone in your life that's brutally honest, you know exactly what I mean. Uh, if you, uh, or when you have kids that are also brutally honest, you will know even more so what I mean. Um, you'll have, you know, one of your kids, like my daughter, who takes a look at you and says, Daddy, you have a big tummy. I said, well, thank you, honey. I like food, right? Um, brutally honest. Sometimes the Bible doesn't sugarcoat things. There are many biblical characters, real people, who are just that, people, flesh, and bones and blood, just like you and me, that had failures, that had imperfections. Abraham was a liar. Like, he lied a lot to very high official people. Moses was a murderer, literally first-degree murder. Uh, you, have, um, you have Jonah, who was disobedient. Jacob, who was a swindler. You have even Peter, who denied Jesus himself three times. And personally, that's one of the things I love about the Bible and one of the strong evidences for why it's not some made-up story. If you're trying to make up a religion, you would put only good things in there, right? Not failures of people, not um, uh, the moral failings of, of somebody. The Bible is brutally honest. And tonight we're going to look at a brutally honest portrait in the life of Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas, who are coming to a point where... They had just served in Acts chapter 15. They had just served together all around Asia Minor. They had just come from a conference or a council, if you will, talking about what to do with new Gentile converts to Christianity, uh, whether they should be circumcised or not. Good news, they don't need to be, right? Um, so they're, they're really coming off of a spiritual high, if you will, and really just working in and with the Spirit, hand in hand. And then they come to a place that we're going to look at tonight where they get into a disagreement. They get into a disagreement. They get into a conflict. And we're going to look at tonight on how to have a godly conflict, on how to have a godly disagreement. We all have conflict and disagreements in our lives. If I were to take a poll right now and say, is it Chick-fil-A or Zaxby's? There's going to be some hands for Chick-fil-A, some hands for Zaxby's. And for the rest of your life, you will never, ever be able to convince the other person otherwise. Because you're so set on a certain principle or certain convictions, and you are just not going to go to Zaxby's for the spicy chicken sandwich when Chick-fil-A has the best one, or maybe Popeye's has the best one, right? You're not going to go, and no one can change your mind. And in the life of a Christian, when you have disagreements with someone... A lot of times that's okay. A lot of times that's okay. We're going to see what happens tonight. Open up your scriptures with me in Acts chapter 15, and we're going to start with verse 36. Acts chapter 15 with verse 36. And after some days, so this is after the council they had, after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of God. And see how they are. Now, Barnabas wanted to take with them John, called Mark. But Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. So I want to stop there just for a minute. So they're best of buddies. They serve together in ministry. And then Paul has a great idea. Hey, Barnabas, let's go on a tour again. Let's go back to all the churches and all the places that we preached. Let's go see how they're doing. Let's go stop in, have fellowship with them. Barnabas says, great idea. 
Let's take John, who's also called Mark. I'm just going to call him John Mark for tonight, okay? Let's take John Mark with us. And Paul says, <laughs> absolutely not. No. We're not going to take someone with us who deserted us when we were in trouble. We're not going to take someone who left when the going got hard and tough. And such a sharp disagreement arose between them that they separated ways. It came to a point where they could not agree with one another. They couldn't manage to find another solution to their problem. And I'm going to look at three things tonight that we can do and that we should keep in mind when we're faced with a conflict, that when we're faced with a disagreement with someone. And the first is you have to separate the person from the problem. You have to separate the person from the problem. In 2 Corinthians 5.16, it says this. 2 Corinthians 5.16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We, we regard him thus no longer. So we are tempted to think so many times that when we, when we look at someone or when we are in a conversation with someone, we tend to judge off of superficial things. They don't look like me. They don't walk like me. They don't talk like me. They don't vote like me. They don't believe like me. And so therefore, we're just never going to find a resolution. I can't separate the problem that I have from this person that I'm seeing. And sometimes we're tempted to look at the person and not look at what really matters, not dig deeper. We have to look more than at just the superficial things we see and realize that behind every problem there's a real person, a precious soul. And that's why it's so hard, for example, on social media and Twitter, when things just go out there and insults and trolling and bullying, because people don't realize there's a real person behind that, reading those comments and reading that thread. A real person with emotions and feelings that might not look like you or believe like you or vote like you or whatever, but they're real people. And 2 Corinthians, in the passage we just read, Paul's saying, don't regard anyone just by appearances, just by the flesh. Because Paul says, even I thought Jesus was just a man. Even I thought Jesus was just a person that died and is dead. But he arose and he showed me something, that the soul of a person is precious. That the soul of every single individual on this planet is precious to God. You know, God doesn't rejoice when the sinner dies. God wishes for every person to accept him as their personal Lord and Savior for the redemption of their souls. Every soul is precious to God. So many times I fear that we look at just appearances and don't look at the soul of a person. We don't see the precious soul that God sees, and we're called to do so, no matter who they are. You don't have to agree with them on everything. You have to separate the person from the problem, right? There's a problem. You might not ever agree on something, but you have to look at the person and say, I don't agree with whatever you're doing or whatever you're saying, but you as a person, God loves you. God loves your soul, and it is precious before God. It is a treasure before God. Because we all know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, the world that he sent his one and only son. What makes us better than anybody else? That we were raised in a Romanian culture, tradition in America? No, not at all. That doesn't make us any better or any worse than anyone else. We're all the same. We are all only redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus. Amen. That's the only thing that we need to keep in mind. Don't look at just the outwardly appearance or position at their spiritual state. When we have disagreements with Christians, remember that they are brothers and sisters that have been redeemed by Jesus. Always remember that. There are some disagreements I have with people, with brothers and sisters in this church, that I just know there are certain things we're never going to see eye to eye on. But then on Sundays, when I... When we have communion, for example, even this past one, I was just standing over here and I look out at the crowd and I'm not looking at anyone in particular, don't get me wrong, but I just see faces of people searching for God and loving Jesus and asking for forgiveness and praising God. And at the end of the day, it's that spirit that binds us more than any problem, more than any disagreement. 
we as believers are called to look not just on the flesh, but look higher than that. Separate the problem. Look at the person. When you're dealing with conflict, with the disagreement, look at the person, how God sees them. Pray to see that preciousness of their soul because God sees it, and God wants us to value that as well. Now, we've talked about the person, right? Separate the person from the problem. So now let's take a look at the problem. Um, Paul and Barnabas had a, a unique situation where um, they were probably the utmost ministers to the Gentiles, and they couldn't agree. And if you look at the arguments they were presenting, uh, both of them seemed pretty reasonable. I mean, one thing we have to keep in mind is that, and I'm going to sound like really old for saying this, but like no matter how flat the pancake, there's always two sides, right? I know. I, I see like the, oh, Johnny, why'd you say that? But it's, it, it's true in so many cases. There are different perspectives on the same issue. There's two sides to it. It could look the same. It could look like you know, you're splitting hairs, but there's different perspectives on it. For example, Paul was thinking, hey, we're not going to take this guy that abandoned us. We're not going to take this guy with us that I cannot trust. If we're going to go on this tour, on this dangerous tour, and go around to different churches and brothers and sisters, we need someone dependable. We need somebody that can stick up for us, that won't run away. Barnabas, on the other hand, said, yeah, you know, he, he walked away, but Paul, nobody's perfect. I mean, just take a look at yourself, right? No one's perfect. Doesn't he deserve a second chance? Doesn't he deserve a shot at redemption? Doesn't he deserve a mentor, you or me, to kind of, you know, pull him through this and let him grow? To which I'm thinking, like maybe Paul was saying, or thinking in his mind, yeah, well, John Mark's also your cousin, right? So there's some nepotism there too, maybe. There's all sorts of different, different uh, uh, perspectives on the issue. And one person, A.T. Robertson, said this, No one can rightly blame Barnabas for giving his cousin John Mark a second chance, nor Paul for fearing to risk him again. One's judgment may go with Paul, but one's heart goes with Barnabas. It's not as clear-cut as we would like it to be. This rosy picture that we've, you know, maybe painted of Paul, we have to be reminded that he was just a person who had his own perspectives and own opinions on things, and so was Barnabas. And we come to this impasse. And before we jump and say, well, Paul's obviously the right one. I mean, he's Paul, right? I wish things were so easy. I wish conflict and disagreements were that easy to deal with and that black and white. What were some alternatives? What else could they have done? During disagreements like this, to me, it looks like it may have been like my way or the highway. But maybe they could have said, hey, well, let's take John Mark with us and, you know, keep him on a probationary period. And, you know, in, if he messes up again, we'll send him home. Or let's take another person with us. That way, if John Mark leaves, uh, we'll have someone to stay with us. Or whatever. So many other alternatives that could have worked. When both sides are valid, I think, I think both were valid in their own opinions, seek a wise compromise. When both sides are valid. When two, um, and I'm just going to use church members, right? When two church members come together and both of them have valid opinions on things, there's biblical verses and biblical reasoning for finding a wise compromise. Not a foolish one, but a wise compromise. You know, so many people think that negotiation is just my way or the highway. That it's this, take it or leave it. And that's just not the case. That's absolutely not the case. There has to be wise compromise. There has to be a give and a take. And in these conflicts, in these disagreements, we have to pray and ask for wisdom in those times. When we think about our most recent disagreements with someone, have we... Have we been willing to kind of step down and understand their side and understand the person and see where they are? Maybe look at the problem and say, okay, we don't see eye to eye, but here's something else we can do. 
Now, there are some, some decisions and some disagreements that maybe don't matter too much. Zaxby's versus Chick-fil-A, whatever. But there are other ones within families, within friendships, within churches that hurt, that cause wounds and deep wounds. And it's when times like these come where we have to ask for wisdom. Say, Lord, help me to see this person as a precious soul that you love. Then help us to find a way through this that glorifies you and that honors you. And Jesus was a master at doing this. Um, if you just look through scripture, he, he was a master at separating the person from the problem, which the problem is sin, right? He would look at the person and he would call them out on what they were doing. He wouldn't compromise on what, on what was right. But he would look at the sinner and he would look at their situation and say, you have a problem. Let's work and fix it. You have a problem. I want to come to your house and dine tonight. I want to eat with you because I want to tell you something. You have a problem. You've been married multiple times, but I want to help you as a person because I value you. Jesus was a master at looking at the real problem, at the real heart of the issue. And so when we get into those conflicts, those disagreements, we have to separate the person from the problem. The second thing we have to do is show the proper emotions. Show the proper emotions. Um, many years ago, when I was much younger, I was at a funeral. And in the funeral, you know, you're, you're supposed to obviously have the right emotions. Uh, just somberness, reflecting, crying with those who cry and being with them. And for some reason at this funeral, I was called up to sing in the choir. I don't remember why. I really don't. They saw me and they're like, hey, come on up here. They called one of my friends, too, so I felt more comfortable going up there. <clears throat> to this day, I still don't know why. But I was up there. And <clears throat> I figured, okay, I'll just, you know, stay in the back and sing whatever. But there was someone next to us in the choir that was singing um, way too loud and not in the right way. Uh, let's just say um, he was, like, tone deaf, right? I mean, it was, it was, it was bad, but really, really loud and right next to me and my friend. And we started laughing and giggling. And we couldn't stop. I knew it was wrong. I knew it wasn't the right emotion. It wasn't. But we couldn't stop. What made it worse was at a certain point I looked up and there was a camera like right in my face. And it was like kind of on me. My friend was still laughing because the camera was on me. So somewhere in someone's home video, there's an image of two boys giggling and laughing at a funeral and probably thinking like, vai, 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 vai de ye. Um, of course, I knew it wasn't right, but I, I, I couldn't stop. I was showing the wrong emotions at this funeral. And I've never liked this phrase of keep your emotions out of a conflict or keep your emotions out of uh, out of a debate or a decision or something that needs factual evidence. I've never liked that because we're people that were created with emotions and everything is an emotional decision really. The issue is keep the wrong emotions out of a conflict or an argument or disagreement and show the right ones, show the proper ones. Are they godly? Do they honor the Lord or do they honor yourself? Do they lift you up and put the other person down? Or does God get the glory? Back in our story in Acts 15 with verse 39, it says that they had a sharp disagreement. And this word, sharp disagreement, comes from a Greek word. I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce it, but just know it means uh, like sharpening like the blade of a knife. Right? Like it's, it's meant to hurt someone. It's meant to be forceful. It's meant to be impactful. And I have to ask myself, and I think we all do when we get to this point of like, oh my goodness, like were they, were they right to do this? Was it, was it a sin for them to have a sharp disagreement? I'll give my personal opinion. I don't think so. I don't think so. I have to put into the context of they were very close ministry partners and friends. And when you're that close to someone... When you get into those types of conversations, sometimes you just talk more freely, right? You're not necessarily trying to put them down, but you just know them better. 
So you start talking as you would a friend versus someone that you've just met for the first time. Now, that's just what I would like to believe. Um, and just looking in the next, right, like in 1 Corinthians, he mentions Barnabas again, and he doesn't put him down. He says he's still doing ministry and everything. So I don't think it was an act of anger or sin or anything like that, but it was a sharp disagreement. They couldn't see eye to eye on something. And when we look at ourselves and in conflict, we have to be very careful about the kinds of emotions that we show. Have you ever met someone who says something like this? Well, I'm not normally an angry person, but, there's always that but, but when I get into an argument with someone, I get angry and just start cursing them out. And I don't know where it comes from. Brother, first of all, you are an angry person. Second of all, out of the heart comes what you say, what you speak, and what you think. What's in there is going to come out. And you say, I don't know where it came from. According to Scripture, we know where it comes from. That's why it's so important to have a godly character. It's so important when we get into those, into those uncomfortable situations where we are in a, in a disagreement with someone, where we start maybe panicking, where we start not knowing all the answers. When we let our guard down like that, what comes inside of our heart comes out. So that's why it's so important to have a godly character because a godly character will drive godly emotions. And for that, I just want to turn quickly to Colossians 3, 12 through 14. Colossians 3, 12 through 14. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts. We have to have compassionate hearts as a character versus callousness. Because if you're in a disagreement with someone, you have to be compassionate enough to put yourself in their shoes, to see where they're coming from. If your heart is hard and you don't have a godly character, the words that are going to come out are going to be um, uh, hard, are going to be not with, 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 the, with love. It's going to be callous. It's going to be like they're hitting a rock and you're not putting yourself in their shoes. It goes on to say we need kindness, this godly character of, 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 of kindness Versus cruelty. When you're in a disagreement with someone, it's okay to be relentless in your opinion, but it's never okay to be ruthless. It's never okay to just be unkind and say, you know what, I'm going to destroy your argument. I'm going to destroy you because I'm right and you're wrong. That's not kindness. That's, that doesn't come from a godly character. And when we don't have that character, those emotions will manifest themselves on the outside. It goes on to say humility and meekness. Uh, or in other words, humbleness, right? We have to have a humble character and not a haughty character. That just means a high and Mr. Know-it-all character because nobody likes a Mr. Know-it-all. No one likes someone who comes up with all the facts with the right argument and just puts the other person down. Humbleness does not mean weakness. The greatest leaders in the world were humble. Moses says, was the most humble person ever walked on the face of the earth at that time. And then Jesus was the most humble of all. They were great leaders, obviously. They were great. Uh, Moses was a great man of God, and Jesus was God. And he was humble. He lowered himself to us, to earth. It means we have to approach it from a humble position. It goes on to say patience. We have to show patience versus impatience. Because losing your patience with someone is the quickest way to end a conversation. If you want to make sure that they just don't listen to you anymore, just lose your patience with them. That will show itself in your emotions, and it will just be radio silence because you've lost it. You've lost it. You're frustrated. And the Scripture says, have patience. Have patience with everyone. And the more we practice this, the more we seek the help of the Spirit, the better prepared we will be during those times where it is hard to be patient. It is hard to be humble. It is hard, hard to, to have compassion. But if we come to God and say, Lord, I need the Holy Spirit to renew me and to renew my mind and to help me through the, the good times, then in those times that are hard and uncomfortable, these characteristics will come out. It also says, bearing with one another, if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. 
We have to be quick to forgive. In any argument, in any conflict, we have to be quick to forgive. If we hold on to bitterness, if we hold on to what someone says, then we're going to have like a poison in our body. We're going to slowly just start getting more bitter and more bitter. We have to forgive in any conflict, in any argument that we are in. If you leave a conflict or disagreement feeling hate for someone, you know it's gone horribly wrong. And that's why Paul says, he finishes it up, above all these, verse 14, above all these, put on love. Put on love. If you leave that conversation and there's not love there, something has gone horribly wrong. Something's gone horribly wrong with something on the inside. Don't blame it on, well, I was just riled up and it just happened. Well, they were really getting on my nerves and it just happened. Search yourself. Be honest. Do an evaluation. Because when you're pressed, when, when you're in between a rock and a hard place or in the awkward situation, a difficult conversation with someone, what's inside of you is going to come out. And it's in those times where we can just come to God and say, Lord, I messed up on this. Lord, I had a disagreement with someone. I did not treat it the right way. God, fill me with compassion. Lord, fill me with love, with forgiveness, with humbleness, with meekness, with humility, because we need it. We all need it. Don't try to keep emotions out of the conversation. Just ensure they are the proper ones. There are many times where you know, again, I've mentioned I've had disagreements, conflicts with people, and I'm a conflict-averse person. That's my nature. I will run away from conflict like the plague. I don't want to be around it. That's just part of my personality. Um, but I have rarely, rarely left a meeting or a conversation where I've just felt like spite for a person and disdain for a person. And when I have, immediately, I know I've done the wrong thing. Not because I'm, I'm an enlightened person, but because God loves me and loves you so much that he sends the spirit to convict you and press on you and press on your conscience and say, love your brother, forgive them. Love your brother, forgive them. Love your brother, forgive them. Remember how I forgave you. Remember how I loved you. And that's a good thing when the Holy Spirit comes and reminds us because it means God still wants to work on us and God wants to move us and grow us and sanctify us. When's the last time you've had disagreement with someone or a conflict with someone? How did it go? How do you feel about it? Did you guys leave on good terms? Did you just kind of agree to disagree and, you know, went off in a, in a peaceful way? Or was there yelling, name-calling? Tonight, I really believe the Holy Spirit can move and convict. And just tell us that we need change, that we need to handle it in the right way. Because if we go about it ourselves and just satisfying our own reputations and our own uh, appearance of, what, of, of how we want people to see us, we're just going to be raising ourselves. And you could win arguments, but you're going to lose a person. And the third thing we need to remember for tonight is to seek to build bridges instead of walls. In a conversation with someone, it's important to build bridges instead of walls. Um, one thing I learned way too late in my marriage was that walking out of a conversation or um, hanging up on the phone immediately is not a good way to build bridges with your spouse. It's just not. And especially when you try to hang up a phone, but it's not as satisfying because it's just a glass screen, so you're like, oh, you know, hang up. Versus back in the day, you could just like slam a phone down, right? That's not a good way to build a relationship. Um, and listen, as Christians, as believers, there are, there are many things that we simply cannot agree with with the world. We can't. God says we are not allowed to. It's against the moral code. It's against God himself. So there are some things where we simply cannot agree with. We cannot agree with sin. We cannot agree with sinful behavior. We just can't. And so if there's someone around us that is exhibiting that or is trying to get us to do that, we disagree with them. 
We don't say, well, for the sake of maintaining peace or for the sake of, you know, not trying to step on their toes, um, I'm just going to give in a little bit. Remember, wise compromise is between two things that are right, and you just have to find some trade-offs. Not between one thing that is right and one thing that is wrong. That's not a wise compromise. Wise compromise is something that's right. I'm going to read very quickly from 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Everything comes back to Jesus. We represent Jesus on this earth. We are ambassadors for Jesus. And ambassadors build bridges. Ambassadors want to say, hey, I don't agree with you on, on, on a lot of things, but I want to keep that line of communication open because there's someone greater that you need to know about. There is a God that you need to know about, and I want to talk to you about that. Maybe not now if, if, if you're not listening, but I want that line of communication to be open. But if we build walls or burn that bridge, we have to ask ourselves, are we honoring God or are we just trying to satisfy our ego? If we cut it completely with people for the wrong reasons because we just can't, because you get frustrated, because you get mad, and we cut that relationship off when that relationship could be used to honor God, it could be used to show Jesus to them, to show the gospel to them, to live the gospel around them, we have to ask, is that honoring me or is that honoring God? The last time, again, that you or I had a disagreement with someone, what impression did they leave with of you? If, you're, if you have to really think in your mind, if you had to guess, what did they think of you after you left the conversation? Were they thinking like, you know what, I don't agree with that person, but he's a person of character, he's a man of God, she's a man of God, or you know, just different, that's fine. Or did they look and say, wow, this person was arguing with me in a way that I haven't even heard my friends curse? Is it honoring you? Is it honoring God? We don't know if Paul and Barnabas ever served together again. We don't know if they ever got back together for a reunion tour. But we do know one thing, they got over it. They got over it over their disagreement. Paul mentions Barnabas again in 1 Corinthians, and he says, Barnabas is still doing work. Or it, it, in that context, he's saying that I'm still a minister of God, Barnabas is still a minister of God, and he doesn't disparage Barnabas. He doesn't put him down. They got over their disagreement because they realized they were ambassadors for Christ, that they had a mission to do, and they had to set their differences aside and just realize that for some things they wouldn't agree on, but they still had to serve God. And so Barnabas went with John Mark uh, by boat, and then Paul went with Silas on foot, and they went in different directions, but they went to serve the same God. And that's where we have to get to at, at the end of every conversation, of every conflict, of every disagreement. You have to continue to serve God. You have to continue to just agree, to disagree on some things, or agree on a lot of things, hopefully, but continue to serve God because you and I are ambassadors for Jesus. Don't burn down the bridges. Don't build up walls. Instead, seek reconciliation. Seek restoration in the relationships because that's what God the Father did through his son, Jesus Christ. And that's what we're supposed to do as ambassadors of Jesus. I'd like to invite the worship team up here as we prepare to conclude and invite everyone else to stand up. You know, Jesus gave the ultimate model for correctly resolving disputes. It's the ultimate example of how we need to resolve conflicts or disagreements. Jesus was treated unfairly 
He was given a poor trial, and he was hung on the cross. And while he was on the cross, he cried out to God the Father and said, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. In all of our conflicts, in all of our disagreements, we have to keep in mind the character from God to us. We have to keep in mind that we can't destroy a person just for the sake of an argument. We have to remember that we need to forgive. In the last conflict or disagreement you've had with someone, maybe there's still pain there. Maybe it's a parent, a teacher, a friend, a sibling, someone from church. It could be someone that you trusted. Someone that the last time you spoke to them, it just did not end well. There was a proverbial slamming of the phone and slamming of the door and walking out of the conversation instead of working through the problem, through the issue. A boss, a coach, a pastor, a leader, someone that you've had an argument with, when, with and you just don't see eye to eye. I think this is the time and this is an opportunity we have in this evening to ask the Lord for his infinite wisdom in restoring those relationships. In realizing that there are some things that you may never agree with someone, but you want that relationship, that godly relationship, and to honor God in what you do. Or maybe there's someone that you see very close on something, but you just don't want to give up. You're stubborn. I mean, you if someone says a color is blue, you're going to say it's blue-green and you're not going to change your mind because that's the way you see it and that's the way you're going to go forward with. And maybe you've learned that from a friend or maybe you've had that attitude ever since you were little and you're like, well, that's just part of who I am. That's technically true, but it's not how God wants you to be, not how God wants you to remain. We all have character flaws from before we knew Jesus that have just come into us and uh, um, have been there since we were born. It doesn't take much work for us to lie or to, um, to want to sin, but through Christ, we are new creations. Through Christ, we don't have to do those things anymore. That's the beauty of having a renewed mind and renewed desires. And over time, Scripture says you're not going to even want to do those things anymore because those things are going to be unnatural to you. The lying, the anger, the cursing, the smoking, the drinking, those things are going to be unnatural to you. Those character flaws are going to become hard for you to do because you've been under the presence of Jesus and seeking and walking in His Spirit every day. And we can try to fake it. I think we've all, I'm just going to speak for myself, I faked it at certain times because I didn't want to admit the problem within me. And I said, well, you know, I'm not really that bad of a person. I think I'm okay. But then I get into a conflict or a disagreement with someone, and my true nature will come out. And I'll say, uh-oh, that's not who I want to be. That's not who God wants me to be. And when that happens, that's the Holy Spirit working on you. And I pray that the Holy Spirit works tonight on my heart and on all of your hearts tonight as well. Ask the Lord for fresh desires. Ask the Lord for a godly character for forgiveness of your sins. Come before him in humbleness so that when those hard times come in your life of disagreements with people, you'll have the Spirit speaking through you. Because as much as we try to avoid it, you know, conflict is just part of the human experience. It's, it's not a matter of avoiding conflict. It's a matter of how we go through conflict. But by remaining focused on Jesus and his teachings, we learn how to face this adversity. We can honor his name even in the fiercest disagreements. And we cannot bring vain to the name of the Lord. And I'll finish with this quote by Philip Melanchthon. He says, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, love. Let's go before the Lord.